This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. This is Creature Comforts, the show all about your animals and the animals around you. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. On today's show, we'll welcome Matt Thorne and Brady Dunaway from the Mississippi Entomological Museum, found on the campus of Mississippi State University in Starkville. They're here to talk about the pollinators that can be found around our state. More than just honeybees, there are native flies, moths, beetles, and other insects that help pollinate our crops and wildflowers. Dr. Majors hasn't joined us yet, but he'll be here throughout the hour to take your pet questions, and Libby's always ready to discuss your recent brushes with nature. So join our conversation with your phone call. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 or email animals at mpbonline.org. If you miss Creature Comforts Thursday mornings, it repeats every Saturday morning at 6. So good morning, Libby. Hope you're doing well this morning. Morning. Yes, I'm doing good. Uh, before we get started, we just wanted to say that we wrapped up Drive Time, our fall fundraising campaign yesterday, and I'd like to thank everyone who listens to Creature Comforts that made their contribution. If you missed your opportunity, though, you can always go to mpbonline.org and make your contribution online. But again, big thanks to uh, everyone who was a contributor during Drive Time. So, Libby, uh, what are you seeing outside your house uh, in the recent days? Okay, um, well, uh, taking a walk recently in the woods with a couple of you know, course, and um, something happened that I thought this might our listeners. Um, walking along, you know, I was talking and looking, looking through binoculars and almost stepped on a cottonmouth moccasin. Uh-oh. But just what she was supposed to do, and she warned me, as moccasins will. And now, this is the, the move that looks very aggressive to many people. She rustled ahead of me quickly and opened that mouth, you know, gaping wide open with the, the white showing. And she blended in perfectly with the leaves along the, you know, the forest floor. But she gaped that mouth open and jetted ahead like that. You know, she came up off the ground her head and did that, which could look threatening, but it's actually like a don't you dare step on me kind of move. <laughs> and it wouldn't have been good for me or her if I'd stepped on her. And my foot was, you know, right lined up to, to get right on her back. So I was very grateful that she was alert and she noticed me when I didn't notice her. And she gave me a very good warning. And we all, of course, we were kind of paralyzed we step back and uh as uh, terry always tells us to do step back a couple of steps and watch her and she watched us pretty intently and then um left quickly so uh anyway i thought that was kind of worth mentioning to people that watch for that warning and when you get it be thankful for it uh, that is definitely a brush with nature for sure um, now, Java told me that he talked to you recently about squirrels, so I'm going to turn it over to Java here for just a minute. Well, yeah, Kevin, I um, I texted Libby the other day where we were talking about, uh, you know, preparing for today's show, and I was outside, and, these, and it just looked like these squirrels were having a real-life conversation. <laughs> one was in one tree, and another was in another tree, and... I should have loaded up the clip, but it was kind of hard to hear. But all I heard was these little, like, kind of vocalizations. And I was like, are those squirrels talking to each other? So I recorded them a little bit, and I sent it to Libby. And Libby, she uh, texted me back and was like, sure enough, squirrels, you know, do have a a vocalization. Isn't that what you said, uh, Libby? Yes, yes. And uh, there are some people who study it. I've read a little bit. We probably need to call Kathy Shropshire to see if she'll do us a show about squirrels. But they they definitely have a variety of vocalizations. They're one of the animals in the woods, and chipmunks do this too, that do one of those like general all-call alerts. If when you walk in the woods, squirrels might be up in the top of the tree, and they'll relay a message, you know, somebody's here, and 
all the animals, you, you know, of, of every species will kind of take note because they, you know, they're accustomed to each other. They're neighbors. And so the birds listen to squirrel warning just like another squirrel will listen to it. But I always thought that was interesting. Um, we have got an early caller on the line. So why don't we say good morning to Alyssa on who has called in. Good morning. You're on the air with us. Go ahead. Hey, good morning. I was so excited to hear about your special guest this morning because I already wanted to call in, and it was just confirmation that, yes, I was supposed to call in. So I'm driving this morning between um, Columbus and Meridian, and as I was driving through Brookdale, I noticed these little puffs, and they looked at first like little tiny clouds floating right above the sides of the highway, and then as I got close and the sun glinted off of them, I realized it was little swarms of insects. I've lived in Mississippi almost my whole life, and I don't remember seeing little puffs of clouds of insects in the morning right over the highway. Um, can you give me an idea what they may be? Well. Go ahead, Libby. Okay. And um, I guess what I, as a child, um, we referred to them as a ball of gnats. And they <laughs> And a little ball looks like a little globe or a sphere, and uh, that's probably what you saw. And um, I'm sure that um, Matt and Brady will be able to tell us more detail, but it's the behavior that, that flying insects do. Remember we've talked about the fact that some flying insects, uh, kind of like fireflies, have um, a very short time as an adult when they can fly and find each other and mate. So they have these behaviors where they all get together, and that may be what happens. Some kind of a small fly or gnat kind of thing has hatched out, and they, this is their chance to get together to mate before, you know, before it gets cold and they all die off. So I, I'm kind of thinking that's probably what we were seeing is a hatching of something. Well, I hate gnats, but that sure was the prettiest I've ever seen them, <laughs> as that sunlight was just hitting them in just the perfect way. And now, what else we'll make in, in something that we don't like? Either termites will do a swarm, and it's absolutely fascinating because it'll be kind of a swirling cloud because they tied enough together, you know, that it's almost like those murmurations of birds or something. And uh, it's really weird looking when it's termites. But if well, you thank talk, you. yeah. I was going to say thank you so much because, as I said, I don't remember ever seeing it that way. And um, I'm in my 50s. So thank you so much. All right. Uh, thanks for the call. If you're still driving, stay tuned. After this first break, we'll have uh, Matt and Brady on from the M Entomological Museum, and uh, we'll check with them and see if maybe they have some thoughts about what you might have seen as well. Dr. Major has joined us, and Dr. Major, since we are talking bugs today, uh, we know that you've told us about your insect collection, very extensive. Uh, are there any kind of uh, rare, rare uh, species uh, in your collection that you're proud of? Well... That's a good question. I, I, I would have to say that <laughs> all of them are fairly rare. Uh, the uh, little tiger beetles, uh, which I'm sure Libby is aware of what a tiger beetle is, they are kind of hard to catch. They they are in the sand, like along a river, or uh, and uh, they have a little burrow, and they'll go down a hole. So you have to be very stealthy to catch any of those. They're brilliant colors, and... Uh, I, I think those are some of the hardest that I've ever had to uh, acquire. But uh, I have some uh, butterflies from uh, Central South America, and some of those are the clear wing butterflies. They are very, very uh, beautiful and, and different. And when they're in the, in the forest, they kind of, uh, on the floor, they kind of look like little ghost butterflies <laughs> flying along. You can't see much of them. So anyway, there's there's... I, I've really enjoyed uh, uh, insects, both butterflies and other types of insects. How, how long have you been collecting? Well, it would have been in the 90s. Uh, my kids were in school, and I started helping them collect, uh, taking them places from the standpoint of uh, science-type uh, exhibits that they were, were required to have, and it kind of kind of carried over uh to me, and uh, I continued on from there. 
I've always been interested in insects, and uh, uh, I really, uh, as a kid, I can remember we had watering troughs, you know, for cattle uh, to come drink, and I always was fascinated with the uh, dragonfly nymphs in the water, you know, how they would they would move and this sort of thing. So it's it's been a fascination of mine uh, all my life. And, you know, I guess with so many different types of insects, it's it's a it's something that, you know, it, it could be a lifelong pursuit. And it's interesting. I never thought about it, but you talked about uh, capturing them. And I guess that's part of the challenge is to be able to get the insect, but you don't want to damage it too much because you, you're going to be displaying it. So to well, maybe talk a little bit about that. And you don't you don't want to uh, be collecting a species or something like that that is that is rare or endangered. Uh, I have. uh one of the things that you can use, and it's worked real well for me, uh, is a Ziploc, uh, Ziploc bag, especially for the, the beetles and other bugs. It works well. Now, some of them will eat through the Ziploc, so you have to be careful <laughs> with that. Uh, the other thing with the butterflies, you actually have a, uh, a way to uh, humanely euthanize them, if you will, and... Uh, then the butterflies and moths, you have to be careful because uh, the little scales that have the color will come off if you're not careful. And you have to basically prepare them for uh, your display uh, with uh, what we call a spreading board. Uh, and the wings become fixed pretty much rather than crumpling up or going in different directions. Uh, it's time for the first break on Creature Comforts. When we return, we'll welcome to the show our guests, Matt Thorne and Brady Dunaway from the Mississippi Entomological Museum. Located in the Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology at Mississippi State University, the museum has a collection of more than 2 million pinned specimens. So up next, we're talking bugs, more specifically pollinators. So stay tuned. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. We're back on Creature Comforts. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major and Libby Hartfield. If you want to join our conversation with a question or comment, you can call us at one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 Email the show, send it to animals at mpbonline.org. As I mentioned, our guests this morning, Matt Thorne and Brady Dunaway from the Mississippi Entomological Museum located uh, on the MSU campus in Starkville. Uh, thanks for joining us, guys. Uh, welcome to the show. First, if you would tell us about your background and how you came to work at the Mississippi Entomological Museum. Matt, let's uh, start with you. Okay, yeah. Back in 2012, I actually started here as a student worker when I was an undergrad and uh, just progressed on, on through grad school and then uh, got my master's degree and came back and I'm a research associate now. Brady, what about you? Well, I've been uh, attending an entomology uh, and plant camp here since probably, I guess, 2010. Uh, summer camp for kids all over the all over the country and all over the world, in fact. Um, once I finished up a couple of years at junior college, I came and started attending classes here at Mississippi State and uh, have been working here at the department ever since I got here as a student. Uh, that's interesting that you bring that up because we've uh, talked about that, and I believe Felder Rushing has talked about uh, that camp on his gardening show as well. Uh, if you would, tell us a little bit about sort of how it works and maybe some uh, memories and how it uh, sort of encouraged you to, to uh, continue in entomology. Again, uh, Brady, let's start with you this time. Well, yeah. In fact, uh, Matthew, who uh, he actually, that's where I met him my first year at camp. He was my first roommate. So I've actually known him longer, arguably, than anybody else here on uh, campus. It's kind of <laughs> neat. But uh, yeah, no, it's a wonderful camp. Uh, kids of a variety of, of uh, age ranges and even adults, you know, I mean, anybody can attend, in, uh, can attend the camp. It's uh, very rigorous. There's a lot of outdoor, you know, we're up at 6:30, and we're out usually until 11:30 or sometimes 12, and the whole time we're collecting insects, attending lectures, um, attending courses on how to. Which I mean, I, of course, I later staffed the camp as well, but uh, but you're teaching if you're a staff member or whatnot, teaching uh, how to pin the insects correctly, how to handle the insects, how to collect them, etc. 
So uh, a lot of a lot of memories, a lot of memories of ticks and poison ivy. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, he spent a lot of time out in the woods and, and the prairies and everything. But it's uh, it's a blast for people who are outdoor minded. You know, who who definitely spend their time outdoors. It's you know a very very gratifying experience. Go ahead, Matt. So yeah, I went to the camp too, and it was really a turning point for me in becoming taking this more as a serious as something I could do as a profession. It took a hobby and turned it into <clears throat> a possibility for the future. Then you know I came back to Mississippi State and then pursued with the graduate program here. All right. And uh, if uh, go ahead. If I may add real quick, the the camp. The neat thing about it is, I'd say, and Matthew probably has a similar experience. I know, growing up in you know. Southwest Mississippi and going to elementary school and you know junior high and high school and even junior college you don't know many people who if you're interested or fascinated by insects or you know what have you some something outside you know there aren't many other people who just share that that hobby that passion per se not like with uh, some a, a sport you know or there are people who play video games or there are people who have book clubs and whatnot you don't really have the same thing so it was probably more rewarding to be able to come and make the connections and meet other people who had, you know, very much the same passions, very much the same interest to the point that every year going to camp was almost more like a, a friends and family reunion. Uh, so, yeah. All right. Uh, throughout the discussion, I'm just going to throw some questions out and uh, either one of you can jump in there or both. So uh, we'll have a fascinating discussion for the rest of the hour. Uh, before we hop into uh, pollinators, we did have that early phone call of a, a lady who was traveling uh, in Mississippi and, and said that she saw a cloud of what Libby thought might have been gnats or termites. I don't know if you all were listening earlier, but uh, what, what kind of bug might that have been uh, uh, that she saw driving along uh, one of Mississippi's highways? So it's probably a little late for it to be termite swarms. That usually happens earlier in the year. I wouldn't really think that would be going on right now. Uh, to notice it from driving, you know, it could even be, depending on the size of the insect, it could be a dragonfly swarm that can happen this time of year. Uh, or even some midges or, fly, or larger flies might have done it. Uh, really, that's a, there's a large variety of insects that can form swarms like that, and it can be hard to tell them apart unless you really can get something on hand to look at. But I would assume some kind of fly is probably the most realistic thing that that could have been. Uh, why do insects swarm? So a lot of times we don't have specific answers. Sometimes it is we think it's you know it's to aggregate for mating to bring all of a, a group of species that may be you know spread across the landscape together in one place to perform some kind of function. You know it can be feeding. It can be something attracting them there for egg laying. It can be you know coming together for you know, reproduction. You know, and it varies species to species, so for any particular one, you don't really know unless you know exactly what you're looking at. My, my theory is they're, uh, they're, they're coming together to form a moot and plan world domination. <laughs> so, yeah. in my theory. They, they certainly have the numbers, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. So we are going to talk a little bit about pollinators, and uh, if we could get uh, a quick Science 101 refresher, uh, what exactly is a pollinator? So a pollinating insect is uh, one that, and of course not all pollinators are insects. You also have bats and birds, and even in some obscure parts of the world you have a, a few lizards that do some pollinating. But pollinators are an organism that interacts with the flowering plant community so that pollen is transferred from one flower of a species to uh, another flower of the same species to fertilize the plant so that it can produce seeds, so that it promotes genetic diversity. Uh, in many plants, especially those with showy, bright flowers, a, a very relevant, for instance, that many people know, goldenrod. So this time of the year, goldenrod is commonly blamed for hay fever, for, for, for fall allergies. But if you actually look at the granules of pollen under a microscope, it's very heavy. The pollen is very large. Uh, the grains of pollen are very large and very heavy. They actually fall down in the air column. So an, a pollinator's job, a pollinator's role would be to visit that flower to get the pollen on its body in some way and move the pollen from one flower to the next to try to help the goldenrod produce seeds. Um, not all flowers require pollinators. Ragweed is a common one. Ragweed is actually usually the culprit for fall allergies because it's wind pollinated. Being a wind pollinated plant, it's, it's pollen floats on the wind and, and uh, you know, transfers from one plant to the next. But now pollinators expect something in return. You know, they don't just do this for kicks. 
So the plant offers something to attract the pollinator, which is usually nectar, or there are some insects that actually feed on pollen, and in the process of feeding on the pollen, they, they transfer the pollen from one plant to the next. Uh, we have a friend, Joe McGee, biologist, who joins us a lot. And last week, uh, he, we talked a bit about pollinators, and I don't remember the exact term he used, but I think it's almost like accidental. Or do some insects pollinate but don't necessarily – that's not their main intention? Yeah, so some pollinators, especially like flies, the flowers will trick them into coming to the plant. Some, some plants will stink. You know, like Bradford pear in the spring doesn't exactly smell great all the time. You know, it's mostly pollinated by flies, and these plants will bring in the flies smelling like something that the flies want. It's usually dead fish. Yeah, but the, the <laughs> flies aren't actually getting anything. They're just mistakenly being attracted to these flowers, and it serves the pollinator role of actually getting a reward that it's just kind of what happens. Yeah. And then we actually have uh, some orchids that are native to the coastal bog and coastal pine savannas that don't actually produce nectar. But bumblebees will visit the flowers uh, expecting the, the flower has guides which would indicate they have nectar. And when the bumblebee enters the flower, there's actually an appendage up her, further up on the flower that is triggered and snaps down on top of the bee. And whenever it snaps down on top of the bee, it just slaps a, a bunch of pollen on its back, <laughs> on the hairs on its back. So the bee actually, it, after, after that, it's frightened. It tries to leave the flower. So it doesn't actually collect any nectar. There's no nectar to collect. And the flower actually has a physical response to apply the pollen to its back. We're visiting today on Creature Comforts with Matt Thorne and Brady Dunaway from the Mississippi Entomological Museum located on the MSU campus in Starkville, talking about pollinators. So I guess uh, for a lot of plants, if there weren't these insects that were pollinating, uh, they, they wouldn't survive. Is that right? Oh, of course. I mean, a lot of these plants are totally dependent on pollinators. You know, some plants can get around other ways, but these plants become really specialized, like this orchid that Brady's talking about. These plants are fully dependent on these insects. If they were gone, the plants would just rapidly disappear. And sometimes there's a relationship formed not only with a group of pollinators, but sometimes only one species or two species. It's part of the reason insect biodiversity is so important, because if you lose one species of insect, we might lose that species of plant that is independent on that one species of insect. And then you don't know what animals might be dependent on that plant, and it causes yeah. it can cause a cascade effect. Yeah. So I think uh, a lot of people might think of honeybees when it comes to pollinators, uh, but uh, we, I would guess, are not the only ones. What are some other uh, pollinators that people maybe might not be aware of? So you know, bees and butterflies are you know the the, the poster children for <laughs> pollinators, but. Flies and beetles and moths, there's a whole range of other things coming to flowers as well. You know, like we talk about the flies with the Bradford pears, being you know, moths are nocturnal pollinators. And then beetles are actually really good pollinators and they oftentimes will eat pollen. They're coming there for that protein source that the pollen gives them. And it just as they eat, you know, they get some on them, they transfer it to the next flower at the same time. Um, are there some pollinators that are more uh, found more frequently here in Mississippi? Uh, so maybe the, the the common pollinators in our state? Uh, certainly, uh, Mississippi is being one of the Gulf Coastal states has uh, you know the luxury of of almost just just entering into that kind of subtropical condition that you see whenever you get into uh, Florida, uh, a little bit further south latitudinally. And so we have species, uh, a really common butterfly is the Gulf fritillary. That's part of a group of butterflies that is actually in, almost entirely tropical. Um, but we have Gulf, uh, Gulf fritillaries as a representative. They lay their eggs on maypops on passion flower, and, but, they, but they visit lantana, zinnias. They visit the, – the adults visit so many different kinds of flowers throughout the year. Um, and so, yeah, honeybees, as a, uh, you mentioned honeybees. Honeybees are a very common example. A lot of people keep honeybees. They're economically very important. And uh, they're actually, I think, Mississippi's state insect. I think, yeah, the honeybee. Um, but honeybees are actually an introduced species. They were uh, introduced by the European colonists. And so they're actually from Eurasia collectively, from Europe, Asia, and Africa, uh, Within Mississippi, you know, for example, we actually have a variety of native bees that often form those more specialized pollinating services to, to more obscure plants and some of the more common ones. Uh, but we have like 450 to 500 species of bee uh, that in Mississippi and throughout many of the eastern states that often get overlooked, but honeybees are the more commonly thought of. 
This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. It's time for another break. Uh, when we return, we'll continue our discussion with our guests today, Matt Thorne and Brady Dunaway, about the various pollinators found in Mississippi. Also, we're ready for your pet questions and other brushes with nature. On the other side of the break, we'll talk about seven native plants that you can plant that are beneficial to pollinators. And also, Gigi is on the line. We'll get to her phone call. So stay tuned. Hey, this is Larry Morrissey with the Mississippi Arts Commission. I'm one of the hosts of the Mississippi Arts Hour, the arts interview show on Think Radio. Each week, myself or one of my fellow hosts bring you in-depth interviews with different creative Mississippians. We talk with visual artists, musicians, writers, as well as people who help bring the arts to their communities. We hear about how each artist learned their craft and get some insight into their creative process. You can hear the Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 p.m. on Think Radio, or listen anytime by subscribing to the show through your favorite podcasting app. This is Creature Comforts, and I'm Kevin Farrell, here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of, the Nat- of Natural Science, and our guests for this hour, Matt Thorne and Brady Dunaway from the Mississippi Entomology Museum, located at Mississippi State University. If you missed any of today's show, you can subscribe to our podcast using your favorite podcasting app, or go ahead and download the MPB Public Media app, and then you get to listen to all MPB Think Radio programs on your schedule. As promised, we've got a caller to get to, so we welcome Gigi to the show. Go ahead, Gigi. You're on the air with us. Good morning. Um, I was. I am 66 years old, and I'm a retired um, state teacher and administrator. And I think I thought I had seen pretty much every insect there was. But I have recently moved to Lake Caroline, and I had planted some new plants in some pots close to my back porch. And I was sitting there letting my Dotson run around the other day, and he kept jumping at the, I think it's called Coolia. I'm not, I can't really remember, but it's tall and it's purple. And I thought, I kept saying, leave that hummingbird alone. It was starting around, and I thought, well, he's fixing to get that little hummingbird. But I kept watching it, and it just didn't seem like it was exactly exhibiting how a hummingbird would normally act. And I kept looking and realized, this is not a hummingbird. What is this thing? And I went inside, and I started researching, and it was, I can't remember the scientific name, but a bee hummingbird. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, yeah, so there's a whole group of moths uh, called the... the yes. Yeah, there's a whole group of moths called the hawk moths that... Uh, they often can fly during the day, and they very much resemble hummingbirds. Actually, some of them are called a, I'm actually called hummingbird moths. They'll actually have clear wings, and they'll hover around flowers, and you know, extend their proboscis down into the flower, and it can look strikingly like the hummingbird going and feeding. There's quite a few species that do this, but the snowberry clear wing is a really common one, and uh, I probably assume that's a pretty good idea of what you got going on. Yeah. It could be. It, I had just never seen anything like it, and I can't remember right now. I should have tried to take pictures of it, but I did not do that. And yeah, um, they're tricky to get pictures of. No, they're, they're striking insects, though. They're really cool to find out in the bow. It was. It was just, I just had never seen anything like it. And I haven't seen it again, you know, but I, I don't normally just sit there for that long. But it was just very interesting so I, I just wanted to bring it up in case any is it considered a pollinator you said yes or no it is um they they have these very long tongues if you look at them they're actually very similar in design to hummingbirds because they often go visit plants uh that are similarly designed you know long tube-shaped flowers usually right Right. And they get the nectar from them. Right. Um, in fact, some of those sphinx moths, they act like hummingbirds, but if you look at them when they're sitting still, they're yellow and black and have clear wings. They actually mimic bees right. and wasps, right. things to avoid getting stung. It seemed like uh, this one did have some kind of bright yellow on it at some point. Yeah. I do yeah. have a picture somewhere. If I found it, I'll, I'll shoot it to y'all because I did take yes, one please do. And, I, and shoot to my neighbor. I forgot about that. Okay. And I know you need to go to other folks, but one more thing quickly. One of your guests mentioned um, South America and butterflies, I believe. Dr. Major, you're right. Yes, okay. Well, I, I have been a short-term missionary to in um, Ecuador and in Honduras, and I just wanted to say, he mentioned the t- little ghost butterflies. I remember in both of those places, at first in Balfate, Honduras, the butterflies were the size of dinner plates. And they would, some of them that I would see, and they would just sit on the rainforest floor 
And it was just absolutely the most amazing thing I've ever seen. So if any of your guests, you know, are interested in just looking those up and seeing what's out there, there are some beautiful, beautiful animals and things in South America. And one other thing in Central, Honduras is Central, one other thing quickly in Central, the first time I went out there in Honduras was a rhinoceros beetle. I had never, I know that's not a pollinator, but I had never in my life seen a beetle the size of that. So that's another fun thing to look at. But thank you for your time and let me share. All right, Gigi. Good, good to hear from you. Thanks for the phone call. Uh, you know, Matt and Brady, the, a, a couple of things there. First, uh, moths the size of uh, hummingbirds and, and dinner size plate uh, butterflies. I, I guess me, I don't know if all of us do, but a lot of folks think of insects as being smaller creatures, but apparently it runs the gamut. Yeah, so the vast the vast majority of insects are really small, and but that it's, they're using up these niches, these you know real little habitats that are very specific. But there are some quite large insects. You know, we have moths here in the U.S. Even if you look at some of like ones from here, like the Polythemus moth, that can be you know four or five inches across at the wing. Uh, and you know, these large ones take up more resources, and so there's typically fewer of them. But there are some large insects here, and especially in the tropics, they can get huge. So, what about uh, the uh, health of uh, our pollinators here in Mississippi? Are we are are these insects in, in fairly good uh, population numbers? So, uh, you know, it varies looking from species to species, and it varies on what habitats they share. So, if you look at uh, you know mo- most areas across the state, the and across the world, really, the largest threat many people perceive the largest threat to bees and butterflies are. Um, you know, pesticides and, and various uh, chemical applicants that can harm the populations. But in reality, the biggest threat to our native pollinators is uh, the loss of habitat. And so if you look at some areas like, you know, Mississippi's Gulf Coast is developing quite rapidly. Uh, there's one instance, there's this bee that uh, me and a couple of others sh- hypothesize should be in one or two areas in South Mississippi called the uh, the, lar- the large plaster bee, and it's uh, found in Georgia, it's found in Florida, found in, uh, I, th- I think there's some records of it in Alabama, but it, it lives on these sand hill habitats that almost look like coastal sand dunes, but they're further inland, and so it's very rare. Um, it's, it's globally endangered, it's, it's uh, not federally listed or anything like that yet, hopefully it will be one day. But it's actually a, a globally, globally very endangered species because it's only found in the southeastern United States. And, uh, you know, its, it's numbers are already very low. Uh, if you go some areas like the Mississippi Delta, some things do really well. Hibiscus bees are doing very well there, not because there's so much native hibiscus growing in the Delta anymore, but because cotton is actually a, a kind of hibiscus and it's a suitable host. Yeah, that's, that's a really yeah. good point, actually, is that these pollinators can be involved with plants that we promote. They're probably doing okay, but we're missing a lot of these native pollinators that only work with native plants that occur in these diminished yeah. ecosystems. Like if, if we support a crop that they can use, pollinators are typically doing okay, but it's the ones that are involved only with native ecosystems that are really suffering, and that's where most of the pollinators are. Yeah, so certainly it's loss of habitat and uh, you know lack of education. Everybody knows honeybees. Most people know bumblebees. And everybody knows but- butterflies, but there's some of these others that, uh, you know, we just most people don't have enough knowledge about, and a lot of habitats being lost that supports them. Uh, before the break, we mentioned there are several plants recommended by the Extension Service that are great uh, service to pollinators. Let me read off the list, and then uh, maybe uh, some comments and thoughts on on what's on the list here. Uh, yes, a- of aster, bee balm, yeah. coneflower, coreopsis, milkweed, oak leaf, hydrangea. And one on the list that I'm not going to pretend to pronounce, it's G-A-U-R-A, Gu- Guara? Yes, Gara, you're very close, yeah. Any thoughts on any so, of those? Yeah, so those are all excellent plants. And uh, they the, the one shortcoming, perhaps, is that they, they're mostly early season bloomers. So if you plant a garden full of those, you've got a wonderful, wonderful plant mix. They're all natives. You've got a wonderful plant mix for a variety of soils and a variety of sun conditions for mainly late spring and early summer, Um, except for the aster. The aster is one thing that it'll bloom usually late summer and into the fall. In fact, we have one species of aster called willow willow leaf aster that actually blooms as late as November, and sometimes you can find flowers in early December 
on occasion. But uh, yeah, I mean, a good a good mix of species for a pollinator garden should have flowers the season throughout. Not so much in the winter because we don't have many winter active bees. But if you want to support those, uh, clovers, dandelions left in your yard are excellent plants to have. Um, another great one is mountain mint. In fact, it's probably my favorite pollinator plant. We have uh, probably four or five species in the state of Mississippi. Uh, but mountain mint attracts everything from wasps that'll come into your garden and, and eat, cat eat, eat the caterpillars or the bugs that are in your vegetable garden. Um, it'll attract native bees. It'll attract butterflies. It, it attracts almost everything, and you can make excellent tea with it. And it's a great native plant, very attractive. All right, uh, we have a caller on the line to get to, so we say good morning to Sharon calling in from Grenada. Good morning. You're on the air with us, so go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to know, I miss the songs of the cicadas in the evening when I'm on my patio, and I just wondered what happened to them and when will they come back? Uh, so cicadas... You know, that's very, they have different broods throughout the year. There's a bunch of different species that come on through the year. And so we may just be in the middle of a, of a couple different species coming active. But, you know, as we hit into the fall, especially getting cooler now, there's going to be fewer, fewer singing insects at night, especially because our nighttime temperatures are dropping. A lot of these insects, you know, insects don't produce their own body heat, and so they're requiring, they require ambient heat to be able to move and really function properly. And now that the evenings are getting cool, we're just going to see less and less of that going into winter. But, you know, that's why they're so active in the summer, especially, is because these you know, cicadas in particular are large, dense insects which need a lot of heat to be active. All right, Sharon, we appreciate your call. Uh, it's time for our last break of the hour. When we get back, we'll finish up our conversation about pollinators and insects in general and talk about some of the rare finds in the collection at the Mississippi Entomological Museum. So stay tuned. On Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, you get information about foods you should eat to stay in good health and tips on how to stay active. I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, host of Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit and Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Listen to the show every Monday at 11 or subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy with your preferred podcasting app. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guests for the hour, Matt Thorne and Brady Dunaway from the Mississippi Entomology Museum at Mississippi State University. We always remember to, uh, if you want to join the conversation, it's a simple phone call, one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 and you can always email the show as well animals at mpbonline.org always like to remind you that if you see something uh, that you find interesting out in nature or are curious about if you can uh, grab your smartphone and take a picture of it that always helps us help you identify what you have seen and a reminder if you want to subscribe to the podcast just find your favorite podcasting app look for creature comforts or you can download the mpb public media app got a couple of phone calls to get to but uh, wanted to maybe finish up our discussion uh, we had mentioned earlier about habitat loss being uh, some of the reason why there's decline in pollinators. One other thing would be pesticide use, and I guess one problem with pesticide is it kind of gets rid of maybe the creature you're trying to get rid of, but also maybe affects uh, other insects that uh, 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 as well. Any thoughts? Yeah. yeah, so pesticides, we try to make them as targeted as possible, but there is overspray, especially with some of the newer stuff we we coat, you know, areas, and the ins any insect moving through these areas becomes affected uh, because of some of the glyphosate use recently. You know, we have less vegetation on the edges of fields that used to be there. I think that's one of the major impacts on these insects. Is it's not that the pesticides are directly affecting them, but overuse of herbicide reduces habitat around fields. And certainly, we uh, there are many insects are so in tune with environmental change that we don't really know what all factors are having or, or are contributing what part to the loss of, of insects. And it's not just bees and butterflies, but it's all manner. If I mean, I'm 24 years old, and I, I can remember a time when I was growing up even, uh, for as young as I am, that you could drive on a summer evening and the windshield was just loaded with insects that you were hitting as you were driving along. And, I mean, now it's... 
people who say that the, you know there there's very much been a decline in insects if you're only using that as a gauge. Yeah. Uh, just the the windshield effect. And so, I mean, we don't know what all really is contributing to the loss of insects, but certainly chemical use and, and habitat loss have got to be your two biggest, two biggest factors in that. All right, got some more phone calls to get to. Let's start again. Our friend Sue has called in from Beaumont. Uh, good morning, Sue. You're on the air with us. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to ask your guest there. This, yesterday was driving up toward Jackson, and there was a patch of goldenrod, big patches everywhere by the side of the road, and I never noticed any bees or butterflies around goldenrod. Do they, they don't need any uh, pollination, or is any, is any kind of insect attracted to goldenrod? Oh, yeah. If you, uh, in fact, I mean, when you're driving, of course, it, it may be a little bit harder to tell, but certainly if you're driving on, say, a country road, and now if you're on 55, it's trickier, but, but if you're uh, driving on a road, you should be able to see uh, things like Gulf Fritillaries and Monarch Butterflies. Goldenrod is oh. extremely important to the fall migration of Monarch Butterflies as they're moving south for the winter. But if you look more closely, there are all manner of bees and wasps and flies and uh, and beetles that are that are usually almost always visiting the flowers of Goldenrod. Yeah, beetles is more my my area of knowledge, and actually, there's quite a few things you typically only find on Goldenrod mm-hmm. that's it's the best way to find some really attractive beetles. Yeah. All right, Sue, thanks for your call. Always good to hear from you. Let's uh, move on next. We've got uh, Timothy, who has called in from Louisiana this morning. Go ahead, Timothy. You're on the air with us. Good morning, John. Uh, Good morning. I love MPB. I I really appreciate it. You know, I wish you'd do a post where you can send in cash money or a check so I can donate to you from over here. I don't have any plastic. But anyhow, um, I love tiger beetles. You know, uh, I've seen them everywhere from below sea level at the, at the Salt Sea in California to oh, 6,000 feet up in the mountains of Colorado. And you know, when I bought this place in Louisiana to build in, I surveyed my whole property to decide where I would build my house so I'd provide the, do the less impact on my neighbors, the, you know, birds, bees, bugs, whatever. That's right. And found a spot and... You know, started uh, laying out my foundation. The son of a gun, tiger beetles moved in right under, you know, in the disturbed earth. I was so pleased. Uh, yeah. you know, that. Yeah, so tiger beetles so often require, the tigers often require that open habitat to hunt on. And so, like, wherever they can find a patch of open grounds, so probably once you disturb the soil and got some nice open areas for them to walk around on, they'll be in there fast. They're a really, actually, a very diverse group of insects that's quite uh, sought by collectors. They get into all these niche habitats and get and they uh, become different species, and it's a really cool group. All right, uh, Timmy, thanks uh, for the call. Always good to hear from you as well. Good friend of the program. Uh, got a couple of minutes left. Matt, this sounds exciting. In 2012, you made a discovery of a mosquito that had not been reported in the state before, the Japanese rock pool mosquito. Tell us about that. Yeah, so that was just after I had learned about the mosquitoes from the insect camp, actually. I was going around just my neighborhood, you know, out in, out in Indiana County where I grew up, and uh, just collecting mosquitoes, and I had a, you know, a book to identify them with, and uh, I found some that shouldn't be here. You know, they had them in the, in, in the book, because they're in other parts of the U.S. They've been in Mississippi before. But I uh, co- found them and then contacted some people I knew here at Mississippi State University and got the identifications confirmed. And it was, since, since Itawama County is a border county with Alabama, you know, there's stuff that had already been known from over that way, but it was just the first time to find it moving into the state. Uh, tell us a bit about that mosquito. So it's a quite a, it's actually a fairly decent sized mosquito. So a lot of mosquitoes have feeding preferences. They won't just kind of bite any time of the day. So this is a mosquito that tends to prefer shaded or like woodland areas. You're not going to find it out in the sun. It's a container breeder. So some mosquitoes, like I said, will have specific requirements for what kind of water they can be in. You know, all mosquitoes want still water without a lot of predators in it. But these mosquitoes tend to prefer kind of shaded water with a medium kind of organic content. You know, it's not full of leaves, not full of all kind of junk, but it's also not crystal clear either. Uh, Actually, they uh, they need a decent sized container, but you can also can find one place people often survey for mosquitoes is uh, in graveyards. Actually, go looking for standing water, you know, around in like the urns. People leave at graveyards. Mosquitoes get all in those. But I actually found them just in buckets of water that people have left out. 
Uh, so, uh, Brady, we mentioned the museum and, and the collection that they have. Uh, what, if you could maybe tell us about some interesting or rare specimens in the collection. Yeah, so, um, you know, we have – the museum's been in operation for so long, and uh, not just that, but many of the specimens that we take in are actually from other museums around the, the country that are, that are maybe closing down, so our museum can expand quite a bit. Uh, we've got a pretty good collection of what's called the Xerces blue butterfly, which is actually a West Coast species. The, there's a, a butterfly society called the Xerces Society that is interested in conservation of, uh, of butterflies and in people who are enthusiastic about butterflies. But the Xerces blue went extinct in like late 1800s, early 1900s, I believe, because it was only found in a relatively small area, I think a, a coastal, maybe island community type off of uh, California, and I think that where where it was found, the the host plant, the plant that it lays its eggs on, was actually developed over, and uh, that habitat was lost, and the butterfly went extinct, and so it only exists as uh, preserved specimens and collections now. We have uh, American burying beetles in the collection, which are are now extinct in Mississippi, or are now extirpated, is is the appropriate word to use if something has gone from a region but not gone completely, you would say, extirpated. Um, it can still be found in small populations, uh, and it's a, a carrion feeder. It visits uh, dead animals, primarily small things such as birds and rodents. We actually used to have a bird called the passenger pigeon in the eastern United States that went extinct a long time ago from overhunting. It was the most numerous animal in North America. And there is some theory. there are some theories that uh, whenever the passenger pigeon went extinct, that uh, the burying beetle began to suffer drastic declines because it was losing uh, it was losing one of its food and breeding places the, the bodies of these passenger pigeons. Um, but yeah, no, we've got so much in the museum and so many things that are rare and and you know and the neat thing is that it's open to the public. Anybody who wants to come uh, visit our museum and see what we have, if they want to try to see all two million, <laughs> uh, and somebody they find somebody, I mean, we'll take shifts. If you want to see it all, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll help that make that happen. All right. Uh, do you have a website, or how would folks learn more about the museum? You yeah, actually do have a website. I don't know the URL offhand, but if you just Google the Mississippi Entomological Museum, it should be the first thing that comes up. Yep. We're, we're called the MEM, I think is what our website might be called. But no, we're happy to have anybody look at the website, and uh, anybody wants to come through campus. We usually have tours. I don't. Yeah. We're not doing much right now because of COVID, of course. But hopefully, here in the future, we'll be able to start doing that again. Yeah. All right. Hey guys, thank you so much. Hope we can have you on another show. It's been a fascinating hour, and you really helped us out, so we appreciate it. Creature Comforts yeah, is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio, funding provided in part by listeners just like you. Uh, Today's show was produced by Java Chapman, and our call screener was Liz Gill. So for Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guests Matt Thorne and Brady Dunaway, I'm Kevin Farrell, inviting you to stay tuned. Up next, it's AutoCorrect with the lady auto mechanic, Allison Walker. We'll be back next Thursday at 9 for another Creature Conference, heard only on MPB Think Radio.